Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm acutely aware I'm the only geezer standing between you and going to the pub, so I'll make this as painless as possible, right? Um, so, um, yeah, hi, I'm Paul. Um, yeah, 22 years in design. Well, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start... Um, I'm going to start by not by having a clicker that works. Uh, that's all right. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> I'm having that one. Um, so, um, I'm actually starting... Um, 30 odd years ago um, when I left college. Um, this, is 19, this is my 1986. I know it looks more like 1886. Um, <laughs> but um, um, so when I left college, I couldn't have a, uh, a career in web design because the web didn't exist um, in its present form. Um, so I trained to be a journalist and I took my first job on a newspaper in 1986. So we've talked a bit about processes tonight, so let me tell you a little bit about my process. So I was armed with a notebook. Um, I had been trained to do shorthand at 100 words a minute, and I could touch type. Neither of those two things I can do now. Um, my stories uh, all had to be recorded in that notebook in shorthand because we couldn't record them because recordings weren't legally submissive, sub legal submissions if ever we went to court for uh, any libel or slander. So all of the stuff had to be handwritten. My stories were typed up on paper. Um, they were um, walked gingerly across the uh, editorial room and handed over to the sub-editor. sub-editor would take a quick look at them. If I was having a bad day, he'd put them straight on the spike, which was literally a, 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 a spike, and it's like if he hated them, they died at that moment. Um, if, if there was going to be some longevity in them and they were going to end up in the paper, um, he would annotate them um, uh, by hand. They would go into the production room uh, where someone would use a linotype machine uh, into which uh, molten lead went uh, to make the letters to make up that story. Uh, my paper was one of the last hot metal presses in the UK. Um, back here with the sub-editor before it got to the linotype, um, it was kind of like a prototype um, wireframe because they used to sketch out every page of the newspaper, work out what the headline was going to be, how the story would run, uh, and they'd do some mathematical calculations around, well, if it's roughly this many words, it would take up this many um, columns in the paper. So it went over, literally, uh, uh, molten metal made the pages. The pages were put into big metal trays called galleys, uh, and you take a galley proof, so in the galley would be inked, uh, the piece of broadsheet paper would then be a facsimile of what the, the, the newspaper page would be. Um, if at that point the sub-editor or, ed or editor had done their maths wrong, there may end up being a glaring hole on the page. And someone would come from the production room and put the metal tray in front of the editor with a kind of, well, what are you going to do about that? And, kind of <laughs> on their face. and the, the answer was always bang a little bit more lead into it. So those of you who have done uh, typography and are used to the phrase leading, um, adding more leading um, uh, at that point was literally taking a sliver of lead and using a mallet to bang it into the galley to spread the, to spread the, the, the pipe out. Um, from there, ultimately, it ended up on this fella here, which is a cossa, um, where which was coaxed to life every Thursday morning to print a newspaper. Um, this was, at this point, probably a hundred odd years old. So let's say it was a little temperamental, right? So it was coaxed, <laughs> it was coaxed through that. Uh, and we always knew when the newspaper had gone to press because the whole building shook. <laughs> well, we knew we were safe to go down the pub because they were printing the paper, so whatever happened at that point, it wasn't going to make that week's paper, so we could happily disappear. <laughs> um, so what did I learn from that? It was particularly bizarre, I guess, to, uh, to talk about this and, uh, in, in terms of lessons learned for, for my later design career. Okay. Um, but I did learn a number of things from that. I mean, first off, it's, uh, and this is synonymous with uh, this group this evening, it's never someone else's problem, right? So the newspaper, like, like all good design, it's a team effort. That newspaper wouldn't have got out if the story hadn't been got and it hadn't been edited and it hadn't been, uh, been made of the type and that type hadn't printed the paper and the paper hadn't come off the press, gone in the back of a van, driven through the middle of the night, uh, delivered by the next morning by... By, um, by small children uh, working for probably less than minimum wage. Um, <laughs> um, the web, web design community is the same. I hear sometimes, oh yeah, we'll fix that in the code, or we'll worry about that later, or this is someone's problem. This is some no, no, no. Everything is everyone's problem. 
good work only happens when everyone works together. Um, good work only happens when there's passion. And I must admit, you know, you, I say you should work with pride and passion when you should move on. I chose to move on from, um, uh, from uh, journalism. Um, it wasn't for me. Uh, I was spending too, many time, too much time chasing people around who had tragedies in their lives and trying to extricate stories from them. Um, so it didn't... That newspaper was, was, was produced every week because everyone in that chain had pride and they had passion. I found that I didn't have that. Um, I moved on. I think that's a really important thing uh, to hold on in, to in our work as well. Um, everyone has a bad day. Occasionally you have a bad week. But if you find yourself having a bad month, you're probably in the wrong place. Um, talking about a massive analog process like that, it may seem strange to talk about agility. But I learned at that point that to be really agile, you really need to have a plan. So... Um, that newspaper could only, could only, you couldn't add a single page to that newspaper, right? You could only add it in, in four pages at a time. So when someone called up uh, a day before we went to press and suddenly decided they were going to book a whole page advert, that had to be a process to go, cool, okay, well, that advert's going to take that page. We've got three more pages to fill. So being able to think off the top of your head about, okay, right, there's a plan. It's got to be a plan. Do I rip a story out to put that, that page advert in? Do I add another four pages to, to the newspaper? What's that going to do for the cost overhead? Are, are we still going to, going to hit profit, profitability that way? So being agile is backed with real planning. And I think that's... that's there's great agile work going on in the, uh, in the web design space. Uh, I prefer to work in an agile uh, manner. Every day that I spend writing an interim report on what the thing's going to be is a day less I'm actually building the thing. So I'm a passionate advocate for, for an agile and lean approach. But to do that, you've got to be well planned. It's not an excuse uh, for not having a plan. And I think the main thing that I learned from that time on the newspaper, uh, I don't know if they did this in Australia, but like in the mid-80s in England, your fish and chips would go into some plain paper and then they'd wrap it up in an old newspaper. So I'd be re really buoyed up about the fact that, that you know, my, my name was on the front page of the paper because I had, you know, the biggest story that week. A week later, there was grease and, 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 uh, and, and vinegar and salt uh, oozing out of it. So... Um, there's that thing about um, you're only as good as your last gig, um, but when your last gig only kind of lasts a week before it's wrapping up fish and chips, you learn to be a little bit more humble. And I think, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a good lesson for everyone. Um, so we'll fast forward. So um, by 1990, I was doing um, what was quaintly described as desktop publishing. So... Um, um, I had a Mac Plus, and, and uh, I couldn't afford a laser printer on my own, so we clubbed together between several of us. I think this was about three grand or four grand, to, for, for, you know, just, and we're talking 1990. Um, the Mac Plus had a 40 megabyte hard drive, uh, and we laughed like drains because we said, man, we're never going to fill up 40 megabytes in a whole <laughs> lifetime. <laughs> um, little did we know. Um, <laughs> So I was doing brochure design, and in 1995, um, one of our clients came in and said, right, I need a website. Do you guys do websites? And we said, yeah, of course we do websites. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about ethics later on, so if I went back there, <laughs> maybe I might have done things a little bit differently, but I'm glad I didn't. So by 1995, I was in digital design, designing websites, and I've kind of been in there in one form or another ever since. Um, but the... Looking back over the over the way in which things have changed in in you know from 1995 to today, so my initial web design was coding two separate websites for every client. We had one for Netscape Navigator and one for Internet Explorer. Um, there was no such thing as as, um, as web standards; they were completely different, um, which was great for earning money because obviously any 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 change had to be done across two websites. Uh, your landing page uh, said, uh, you know, access here for Netscape Navigator, access here for Internet Explorer. It's kind of unthinkable um, <laughs> to, to where we are now. Um, 
I had HTML to play with and I had animated GIFs. So I'd like to publicly apologise for all the design crimes that I calculated <laughs> through, through the mid 90s. Um, people were consuming that content on dial up modems. Um, so, um, yeah, 14. We were worried at the time around whether people were going to be on 14 4 modems or 28 8 modems or. Um, some people went all the way to a 56 modem, which meant that they probably only had to wait a day before the home page um, downloaded. Um, uh, web, web pages were 30k in size. Your minimum, your, your maximum was always you, you've got to bring each page into 30k max because otherwise uh, download times would be, would, would be terrible. Obviously, since then we've we've had broadband. Uh, we've had um, uh, mid 2000s. Obviously, the explosion of smartphones. I was working in London at, at Transport for London at the time, um, and um, again, this is unthinkable really now. Um, but like the, the iPhone launched, and we thought uh, we kind of better check the web stats and see like how many people were accessing the site with, with one of these new iPhones. And it was frightening. It was about like fifteen to twenty percent, you know, out of nowhere. Of course, when your your context is around planning a journey and, and you've had to do it at home before you left and then all of a sudden there's a device to allow you to do that on the go, well of course you would use it. Um, and like moving on to today, I mean, oh, of course there's, there's, um, there's a whole social media explosion um, uh, and then moving on to today around whole different paradigms around people who are interacting with our, with our content and our design through speech. So I think right back at the beginning when I could really control, uh, I had ultimate control really, people were on Netscape Navigator or they, they were on Internet Explorer and it was a fairly locked down a bunch of audiences whereas now that content can be sliced and diced and cut and, and, and searched for and repurposed on social media and uh, maybe interacted with, with, with speech rather than typing. It's, it's, it's such an amazing amount of change in what's a relatively short space of time. So, um, if I can be as bold as to give you all some advice, um, during your careers, um, you're going to be designing for, for contexts and technologies that don't exist yet because people haven't invented them. That's kind of mind-blowing when you think about it. Um, but it does place the onus on all of us in the, as designers to do a number of things. My first piece of advice is, is, is to be constantly curious and constantly learn. Um, embrace that reinvention and be, be comfortable to, to pivot into something new. So between 1995 and today, I've been webmaster, web developer, web designer, information architect, um, I've uh, interaction designer, um, content, user experience, customer experience. I now talk mainly about sort of design leadership and service design and all sorts of other things. Um, that's a, the, the, the days of kind of doing an apprenticeship as I, you know, as I did and doing an apprenticeship in an engineering sub, uh, uh, um, scenario in the old school sense of the word and doing maybe 30 years, doing 40 years, doing the same job and then getting the gold watch and the handshake and patted on the back and going off into retirement. That, that's not a thing anymore. It's not a thing for us. We, I haven't experienced that. You won't experience that. So you need to have a toolkit. You need to. I mean, I think um, around some of the uh, some of the things I find myself now going right back to some of my journalism stuff. So when I started getting more into user experience and doing user research, a lot of that was around interview technique that I actually learned in a completely different context 15 years before. <coughs> So think about, think about toolkits rather than a specific skill. Try not to wedge yourself to a specific skill, but have, have skills which are transferable across different contexts, across different technologies, because they're going to be invented, so you're going to have to reinvent yourself to go alongside that pace of change. A um, couple of stories for you. Does, any, does anyone know about Boo.com? Great. So I can make it up and no one will know. Um, so um, 1998, um, huge, huge crash. I was, um, I was at that time, 
probably doing more work training people how to use Dreamweaver than I was actually building websites. And I was booked out, like, for 18 months, I was booked out six or eight weeks in advance. And every time I'd done a week, another week was added on the end. And then around about sort of 1998, I had eight weeks of bookings and then seven, then six, then five, then four, then three, then two, then one, then none, and no work at all. Just went off the, off the end of the cliff. Um, Boo.com um, uh, decided around this time that they were going to revolutionize the way in which we bought clothing online. It was going to be... It was going to be virtual reality. It was going to be complete change. We were going to be able to see um, uh, images of people wearing the clothes that we would be able to rotate around and kind of see what it looked like from all angles, and, it was, and they were going to kill the opposition. Actually, they actually made the news. I remember seeing them on the, on, the, on the TV news in England about how it was going to be an amazing thing and how it was going to change uh, uh, the world. Um, just to, so I don't misquote myself, I have a note here. They went through $135 million of venture capital in 18 months. Um, when they launched, the site didn't work. <laughs> because it wasn't none of the code and none of the, the heavy coding that was needed to deliver all of these mind-bending technologies. None of it worked in the browsers that were available at that time. It was a complete and utter fail. Um, so they made the news, uh, they were high profile, they, they got $135 million worth of, of venture capital, they burnt the whole lot, and they went into the receivership. Um, MySpace, I know they're still going, I'm not, I'm not, it's not an epitaph as such, um, but it's worth remembering between 2005 and 2008, they were the biggest um, uh, social media uh, site in the world. And again, to my notes, um, in June 2006, they surpassed Google and were the most visited website in the States. MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> that old thing. Um, when I was researching stuff for tonight just to check on dates, I read this. I don't know if it's true, but apparently MySpace wanted to buy Facebook and they offered Zuckerberg, uh, sorry, they asked Zuckerberg how much he wanted and he quoted $75 million and MySpace thought that was too much money so they didn't take him up on the offer. But as, as recently as 2008, they were, the, they were the prime social media site in the world. So bear that in mind. <laughs> Bear that in mind. My lessons. Um, I could have done something shorter, but I got a bit carried away. So, <laughs> talking about boo.com, uh, they thought they were cool. Um, they convinced everyone else they were cool, but their product did not work. It failed. So, bad things can happen if you don't align the business objectives um, and the tech and the user expectation and the marketing all in the same place. This is back to, I guess, we're all in this together, really. Um, so they, they had amazing marketing. They convinced the, the BBC News to say that they were going to be great. They convinced enough investment banks to give them $135 million worth of money. However, they obviously didn't have any testing regime. They, didn't, they obviously didn't understand how the code was going to work. Uh, they obviously didn't have a proper business plan. And slightly unluckily, they launched in the teeth of a, a, of a, um, of a tech recession. Um, let's think about the MySpace paradigm. You know, we hear a lot about disruption, but disruption's constant and, and, and actually nothing new. Um, ubiquitous, seemingly unassailable monolithic companies can disappear in an instant. I'm not saying they will, but they could. And I think um, as designers, we can get a kind of false sense of comfort that the thing we're doing, um, we're safe, we're in a job for life, we're doing this thing, this thing's big, nothing can really happen to this thing. Well, actually it can, I've seen it. Things come and go in an instant. So, again, that aligns to this constant reinvention and thinking very carefully about what it is you do as a craft and how you are going to move that craft forward on a personal level. Because 
you should never assume that the place you're turning up to work to is going to be rock solid for the next six months or the next six years. It could well be, but prepare yourself, you know, for, for turbulence and change. And to round off, um, Enron. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this next sentence, let me finish before you jump on my, my I, did, I did a little bit of work for Enron, <laughs> but, but, but I wasn't responsible for it. So um, in, the late, in the late 90s when I was doing the Dreamweaver training stuff, um, they got me in to, to cross train uh, their tech and, uh, and their design team. They saw Dreamweaver as a thing where everyone would meet in the middle. So I did quite a lot of training with quite a lot of people there. Um, uh, this was at a time when everyone's um, sort of CRT monitors were about two foot deep, right? Your, your monitor was, you needed a desk that wide just to get the monitor on. I turn up at Enron, everyone's got flat screens, which at the time would have been monumentally expensive. Um, I remember looking out the window, they, were in the, they had a big office in the Buckingham Palace Road in, in, in London. I remember looking out the window, there was this huge um, building going up next door. So I said to one of the guys, so I said, oh, you've got a, you know, some new neighbours moving in there. I said, they're, they're pretty close. And they said, no, 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 that's our new hotel. They had got fed up with paying other people's hotel rates, so they were building their own hotel to put people in. <laughs> the amount of money that was sloshing around that place was, was incredible. Um, again, I want to check. In the year 2000... They claimed revenues of $101 billion. 2001, they were bankrupt because they, they lied. It was a complete fallacy. It was a complete lie. None of that money was real. So they were gone. Lots of people have been telling lots of very bad stories. Uh, and it was all an illusion. Um, and I wanted to end where I came in by talking about content. Um, I'm not making a political point here at all, um, but I'm, I'm making a point around, um, around diligence, I guess. So I don't know if anyone saw this story recently that was doing the rounds. Um, there was the, um, the Twitter account of Jenna Abrams, 37,000 followers. Turned out to be a completely fake site generated by those pesky Russians. Um, what scares me about this is the fact that that account had been quoted in a number of um, respected media organisations as a real person. So I'm reading off the slide. So CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, and a whole bunch of politicians. Tweet, retweeted or featured uh, tweets from this account in news stories. Right back when I did journalism, none of, you know, checking your swear, whatever happened to checking your sources, right? This was a Russian bot. We are seemingly in a situation where a, um, uh, a, a bot can control the news agenda. Which leads me to um, my final lesson to learn, which is slightly more serious. Um, some of them are around ethics. Um, I think that um, you, can, you can call me an old hippie, and believe me, I've been called a lot worse. Um, but I do really firmly believe that if you, if you project um, ethics and honesty out into the universe, you'll get it back. You can cut corners by telling lies, and you can cut corners by doing people over, but it will ultimately come back to bite you. Um, play the long game, is my advice. Um, have ethics uh, to your client. Always give best advice, uh, even when it's not necessarily going to be helpful to you. Um, have ethics to your team. Don't ever make anything, anyone do anything that you wouldn't be prepared to do yourself. And have ethics to yourself. Be honest. Um, and, and also be diligent. I cannot believe that, that we're in an age where, where um, 
don't want to, again, don't want to be political about the very loaded term fake news, but fake news is a thing, and a lot of that is down to the lack of due diligence that, that is done by people that produce content. Over the years, I've been one of those, and I'd like to think that, that I would take a little bit more diligence over some of this. Um, and on that note, I think it's time for the pub, unless anyone has any questions. <laughs>